Welcome to the pre-show, everyone. We're coming to you live today for the Network Plus Study Group. We'll be starting in about 10 minutes. Let's uh, update the website. Uh, I've already done audio for the podcast. You weren't here for that. Where were you? That part's done. Now let's make sure that everything is working on the site as we would expect. Uh, those things are working. These things are working. All right. What else do we need to do? Let's try. Um, let's try some uh, camera checks. Camera, 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 camera check. Camera one, camera two, camera three, and camera four. It all works. Oh, here's the one from last week that wasn't working. Fixed it. So that part's good. All right. Well. I think we got everything working. Last week, the lights would not turn on, if you recall, if you were here for last week. Oh, by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, the uh, the chat room is at professormesser.com slash live. Uh, this would be the Network Plus study group. Professormesser.com slash live. Uh, we'll put that in that chat room. We'll put it in this chat room. <clears throat> Is everything else in order? I think it is. Uh, warm beverage. We've got, I should probably pull this a little closer so I can see what's going on. That's a little, that's not good. There we go. That's not, this is not where I was going with that. Boy, that needs to be tightened up a bit. Okay, that's good. So I can see those things. I can see this thing up here. I've got this here. That's there. Hello, little rock. Uh, Network Plus exam tomorrow. Perfect timing. So that'll be great. We'll be able to get this happening. Uh, you saw a question on the Security Plus 401 studies that said triple DES was better than AES. Well, I guess the question is better how? Better in what instance? How is it better? What and what? What's the use case? Because some encryption technologies are better than others in certain cases, and not better than others in other cases. So it really would just depend. Although AES is pretty good, uh, triple DES is still uh, still viable though. People are still using it. It's still pretty strong. Uh, what am I looking for? I'm looking for my keynote. California's checking in. Very nice. That's working. This is working. Might as well play that. Uh, we got these things. We're recording down here. We're recording up here. We're recording online. I have been working on getting... So if you're watching on YouTube... Well, you're watching on YouTube because that's how I'm streaming it. Um, but if you're on my website, you're watching an embedded version of YouTube. So I'm streaming all of this to YouTube and only YouTube. So there is, um, this is all streaming at 720p, which you know for what we do is probably fine. Uh, but I am getting some some new equipment in that's going to let me stream at 1080p since I'm doing all 1080 here in the room. It would just be nice if you could join us on 1080p. So I'll be doing that. You can of course on. YouTube adjust whatever resolution you would like to save bandwidth or whatever. All right. Maryland studying for the network plus 006. A lot of people do when they're 006. Don't blame you. Get it done before the end of July. Very nice. It's July or August for network plus. It's August for network plus. It's July for security plus. Is that it? Utah's here. Everybody taking their test pretty soon. That's good. Network Plus in 90 days. Well, I guess it would depend on which one. South Africa checking in. Ohio's here. Northeast Ohio. Let's get that straight. Um, close Little Rock. Houston is here. Very nice. Everybody's showing up. I got good questions for you this week. I think I do. I wrote them last week, so I have to remember what the questions were. I think we're in good shape. There's already a question there, professormesser.com slash QA. Um, there's a question waiting for you. Hopefully, you'll be able to get to that. 
All the links for everything you would need, including the chat, are on my website, professormesser.com slash live. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice there's no chat there. So is it true 007 is easier than 006? I don't know where people get this idea that one version of the exam is easier than the other. Uh, it's not more compressed. Um, there's really not much cloud technology on it. It's The Network Plus 006 and 007 are similar to each other, but there's a, there's a good chunk of data that is new. In fact, I should bring up my sheets that have exactly the statistics on how many new topics are on 007 versus 006. They're just different. Not One is not harder or easier than the other. They're just talking about different content. All right, so I got those stats up if we need to reference those. <clears throat> and some things in 006 are not in 007. So it really just depends on what you want to do. Now with Network Plus, these things don't tend to be updated very much. Network technologies don't turn over rapidly like we see with operating systems or to some degree even security, although security is not fast as hardware and operating systems. The A-plus is... It's tough to keep up with those topics because it's changing every week. There's a new chip. There's a new video. There's a new this. There's a new that. But for networking, you tend to put this stuff in. It stays there forever. So you don't s tend to see a lot of things swapping out. And CompTIA didn't make a lot of changes to the 006, to the 007 exam from the 006. So there you go. That's, that's the story. <clears throat> getting a little cold, to get a little, get a little froggy, get a little, uh, get a little something happening there. I need more uh, vitamin C. We are very close to showtime. Three minutes, is that right? That is correct. Three minutes, and we'll get started. Uh, let's see if I can get some things up and running on my screen already. Maybe I can get logged in. Let's see, we'll get logged in. Let's get uh, Network Plus. <laughs> Which one should we do? Well, I'll do the slides. We'll go back. I uh, got the questions are good. This is good. All right. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, to answer the question about which is harder, I don't think either of them is, is harder than the other. I just think you need to concentrate on the exam objectives and you'll do fine. I don't see that there, there's a big difficulty level difference between the two. I see that this goes back and forth on Reddit. People talk back and forth. All the 007 is easier than the 006. All the 006 is easier than the 007. There's no way you would know that unless you took each exam three times or four times or five times and you went through all the questions in the pool. There's just no way you'd be. No one does that. No one can do that. Once you pass the exam, you can't take it again. So that's one of those things. So there you go. Um, I think I think we're in pretty good shape. I had to swap out power that's up on the ceiling after the last study group. I was able to get a replacement very, very quickly. Thank you, eBay. And then, um, so that's working now. Uh, I've got the 1080p streaming device coming, I don't know, in the next week. Maybe it will be here before the Security Plus study group next week. Maybe not. We may have to wait till July for that. But I will probably be uh, doing a, a, as soon as I get it and plug it in and work with it, we'll probably do a test live stream that is not on a Wednesday. So you can look for, if you're following me on YouTube and you've clicked the little, uh, the little alarm there, you'll be notified if I do that. And I'll tweet out and that kind of thing. So we'll get those things going. All right. We're in pretty good shape here. We're about to get ready to do this. Uh, oh, what do I need up on my screen? I need Skype. I need to set up my call in for this later. So we got that. Um, my shows. Host a show. This is good. This is very, very good. All right. Um, and how is that possible? Oh, there we go. Okay. It's time for live stream, everybody. Let's get this thing ready to go. This is uh, this will be a good one. Get these ready. This will start here. We got a slide going there. Yeah, I think this might happen. Let's uh, adjust this so it's not tugging on me the whole time. Straighten up and fly right. And here we go.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to the June 2018 Professor Messer Network Plus Study Group from our world headquarters here in Tallahassee, Florida. Thanks for joining us today on this live Q&A that we do during this first hour. And then the second hour, I open up the phone lines and we turn it around. You ask me questions instead of me asking you questions. Or you just call in and talk about whatever you'd like. It's open phone lines on the after show. But right now, we've got one hour of Q&A that we're going to do about the Network Plus exam. So if you're studying for your 006 exam or you're studying for your 007 exam, you're in the right place. I have questions for you. What we're going to do comes from all of the videos that I make available on YouTube. You may be familiar with my training course. It's available every minute of every video, a complete 006 and a complete 007 course is available for you to watch absolutely free. You can find that at professormesser.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. I do a free question every week. Yeah, I think it's on Tuesdays. We put that Network Plus question out there so you can see how well you're doing with Network Plus. You can find that at professormesser.com slash Twitter. As I mentioned in the pre-show, I'll probably be doing some additional call-in or ad hoc presentations, events, sometime in the next week or two or three. And if you want to be notified when that happens, you want to subscribe to us on YouTube, professormesser.com slash YouTube and click the little alarm if you want to be notified for that. And got a, lot of, a couple of emails this week where people were looking for the voucher discount. You can always find a discounted voucher code at professormesser.com slash vouchers so that you take a little bit of money off the top. Don't pay retail for your voucher. Of course, if you have an EDU email account, you want to go to the CompTIA student, uh, the educational discount. Uh, we'll find that later in the study group. I'll find that uh, that link for you so you're able to find that. But if you uh, do a quick Google search, you shouldn't have any problem hunting that down. For the rest of us that don't have an EDU account, go to professormesser.com slash vouchers. My entire uh, course, either the 006 course or the 007 course, are available to watch for free. They're also downloadable versions that you can get. I have uh, digital editions that are brand new. A lot of you want to get uh, the flash drive that I send that has all of this offline. But others of you said, I don't need a flash drive. I don't need anything shipped. This is the modern era. I can simply download these things. So there's a, 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 a price that's a little bit lower than that. You don't have to pay so much for the, the complete physical edition. There's a digital edition available as well that has the videos. It has the MP3 audio files. It has my course notes. All of it's there. So you can find out about that at professormesser.com slash getnet plus. A lot of people are starting to find the questions that I have online. The 007 course has just come out. So I don't have 007 questions available yet because those are archives of this study group. But you can find them at professormesser.com slash pop quiz. Some free questions to help you with your Network Plus studies. There's also A Plus and Security Plus questions there as well. And of course, all of this information is recorded digitally for people to listen to later on at their convenience. You can find those replays, the audio version of those replays, at professormesser.com slash podcasts, where I have podcasts for A Plus, Network Plus, and Security Plus study groups. That might help you as you're traveling along, you're in your car, you're listening in, you don't have a way to watch video. This is another way to get this study group content in a way that can go in your ears and into your brains so that you can pass that exam. In the pre-show, we were talking about the two different exams that are available right now. There's a Network Plus exam in 10 and there's also a Network Plus exam in 10 7 Both of these exams exist now at the same time. But you only need to take one and pass that one exam to earn your Network Plus certification. The 006 is being phased out. It is being retired on August the 31st of 2018. So the 007 was released on March the 1st of this year. And after August 31st, that will be the only one that's available. So CompTIA gives you some time if you've been already been studying for the 006, they give you some time to finish up your studies so that you can pass that exam. Other people that maybe are starting right now with your Network Plus studies, you probably want to start with the 007 materials. An important part of this 
is regardless of which exam you choose to take, make sure that your study materials match the version of the exam. So if you're planning to take the N10006 exam, you need to study from materials that say N10006. If you're planning to take the N10007 exam, you want to study from materials that say N10007. I know it seems obvious, but there are some pretty big differences. I've got the stats up on my screen where I looked at every single objective in the CompTIA exam objectives for the N10007. There are, by my count, the way that I count them, uh, which is roughly 499 different objectives in the Network Plus exam objective sheet. You can find those exam objectives by Googling CompTIA exam objectives, or you can go to professormesser.com slash objectives. So of almost 500 total objectives of those 171 of those objectives are brand new in the 007. So that means that about 35% or so, 34.2685% of the exam objectives are brand new in the 007. That means if you're studying 006 and you go walk in to take the 007 exam, you're missing about 35% of the content that you need to be able to pass this exam. That's a pretty big chunk of content. So make sure that you study from the right exam objectives. Now, if this is after August 31st, you're watching this on a replay, and this is well after August 31st of 2018, it doesn't matter. You'll be studying 007 content. Although the, the idea still is the same, right? You still need to make sure that you study the 007 content if you're going to take the 007 exam. Today, we're going to do q and I've got questions already done. I create a brand new set of questions every month. These are questions you've never seen before. I'm going to ask you these questions, and you're going to answer them live and online. And you do that by using a third-party service that's been really great to use called Socrative. You can find that this very easily. Pop open a new window. You can go to professormesser.com slash QA, and it will redirect you over to the right place. There's a question waiting for you right there. As a matter of fact, you'll see it. There's also apps you can get for your mobile device. Those apps will be able to tell you what the appropriate uh, question, show you the information, keep up with what's on the screen. It's very easy to find. You can find the Socrative student app. Make sure you get the student app and not the teacher app uh, at uh, your favorite app store. Just go to your favorite app store and everything will be there that you need to find. It's all available for you to work on, and you'll be able to see that there is a question waiting for you right now. Here it is. It's actually a question from last week. Don't answer in the chat room. You want to answer on Socrative, which is professormesser.com slash QA. So the question is, you need to query all of your routers every five minutes to gather performance metrics. This is a very common thing to do, as a matter of fact. Which of these would be the best way to accomplish this? Would it be A, configure a script to SSH into every router? Would it be B, use RDP to gather the remote statistics? Would it be C, query each router with SNMP? Would it be D, connect the routers to the same IP subnet? Or would it be E, configure a port mirror on each router? So that's what you want to do. You want to find that to be able to figure out which one of these things it is. So hopefully you can remember. In fact, We'll do this in real time. So as you're answering this, you can see in real time, I get to see on my side as you're answering which ones are being answered. You'll be able to see these as these roll up. Now, if you were here last week, this should be a pretty easy one since this is a question that we did last week. Hopefully, that's one that you were able to remember. And I think you were. 79% of you said C, query each router with SNMP, which is the correct answer. That's what you want to be able to do. That's what SNMP is. That's the Simple Network Management Protocol. It sends queries to devices and receives responses in return. It's a, a nice utility, nice protocol to use. There are a number of front ends that allow you to gather this information and a lot of different versions available for this. So this was our test question to see if you're able to get into Socrative. It's obviously our rewind question of the month from last month. We want to be sure that everybody can get in to see all of the questions. And hopefully, you were able to do that now. And if you're using SNMP, then you're probably able, let me quickly go through my SNMP and show you a graph that I made. Here's a graph I made with SNMP. So I queried, uh, in this case, a firewall every x number of minutes, maybe every minute, it looks like. 
and then I get to see this looks like response time. So I can see response time statistics because my particular firewall is able to do that. So we were, hopefully, if you're one of the folks that answered C, query each router with SNMP, you got that one absolutely right. Well done. All right, now it's time to get past the questions from last week. We want to jump into brand new questions. And one of the things that I like to do every month is give you right out of the gate a performance-based question. Some of you may not be familiar with this. So let me quickly go through what you can expect when you sit down on your actual Network Plus exam. A lot of people are accustomed to these exams having a, a multiple choice question. So you get a question just like the one we just had. Here's a question, and here's a number of options that you can choose from on your multiple choice. And certainly, your Network Plus exam will have plenty of multiple choice questions. But at the very beginning of the exam, they ask you questions that are not multiple choice. They are anything but multiple choice. So you might get a fill in the blank question. You might be put at a command prompt and asked to perform a particular function. You may be given a network diagram and asked to drag and drop things into the network diagram. You could be given uh, a list of things to put in order from fastest to slowest or slowest to fastest. Or you might be given a question like the one I have this month, which is, categorize the following protocols as secure or insecure. So this is a set of protocols that I've listed here. And I'm doing this just as a fill in the blank. So online, you're going to have to type this in to Socratic. But you can do it very easily. You could say, if you think everything is insecure, you could say 1i for insecure. If you think everything is secure, you could say 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. So you would put an S or an I, or you could type them out if you're someone who likes to type those. But for those of you listening, here are the protocols. The first protocol is SNMP v3. The second protocol is LDAP. The third protocol is TLS. Number four is Telnet. Number five is FTP. Number six is IPsec. And number seven is SSH. And I want you to be able to tell me which of these protocols are secure and which of these protocols are insecure. There is an aspect to this on both the 006 and the 007 exam. So this is one of these questions that applies to either one of them. If you are studying for the 007, you can see this is for the 007 section 4.5 device hardening is where this is coming from. Now, make a note also as you're typing these things in of what it happens to be. Because when you click Submit in Socrative, it doesn't show you the answers you chose. So you have to wait to see on the screen. But then you have to remember, what did I choose for number two again? I forgot. Number of your answering, secure or insecure, stop Googling. We're going to pretend we're sitting at the exam that we don't have Google available to us. Not sure if you knew that. No Google available in the exam. Here's your little exam tip for you today. So let's, we've got a number of answers. I'm going to wait for a couple more of you to submit questions. Be ready for these multiple or these, these performance-based questions before you hit the multiple choice. One of the strategies I use when I take CompTIA exams is I actually skip over the performance-based questions first thing. I'm not a person who does well in test environments. And I'm, I'm very anxious as we start the exam. And I just skip over these very involved and complex, multiple something performance-based things. And with the CompTIA exams, you can bounce back and forth. You can move to any question at any time. So I go past the performance-based questions. I flag them and go past them. And I go to the first multiple choice. I work all the way through multiple choice questions. And what I find is by going through the multiple choice, it jogs my memory about things that will help me with the performance-based question. So by the time I circle back, it's very useful to have that information in your brain very recently. Oh, I saw in the last question this can help me. So keep that in mind as well. That might be able to help you too. Some people don't like doing that. Some people like hitting the performance-based questions, getting them out of the way. Either way, keep an eye on your time. Time management, very important during the exam. You don't want to skip over those and not come back to them, not have enough time to come back to them. So let's go through these protocols. Are they secure or insecure? We'll start with number one, SNMP version 3. SNMP version 1 and version 2 are not secure. They're insecure. But version 3, quite secure. 
That's where the protection comes from. The confidentiality, among other things that we use with SNMP, some encryption is built into this and makes it a secure protocol. Let's go to number two, which was LDAP. LDAP, the Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. LDAP on its own is insecure. There are extensions that you can use with LDAP. One of the popular ones is LDAP S uh, for LDAP Secure. But LDAP by itself is not a secure protocol. We put that into the insecure column. Number three was TLS. TLS. TLS is the transport layer security. That is what you use when you connect to a website over an encrypted channel. So that would be secure. Number four was Telnet. Telnet. Uh, this Telnet is a console-based front end that you can use to go to the command line of different devices. But by itself, tel Telnet completely insecure. If you're typing in a username and password at that console, anyone gathering packets on that network will now know your username and password. Number five is FTP, the file transfer protocol. And by itself, FTP is insecure. There are secure flavors of FTP, SFTP, and FTPS, which are completely different protocols in how they operate. But those are two flavors of FTP that add security through encryption. Uh, one of those methods using SSH for the encryption and the other one using TLS for the methodology. Number six is IPsec. In the name is the SEC part. And the SEC for IPsec is IP security. So you can bet there is some security there. It's built into IPsec. That's what we use. Now, IPsec doesn't necessarily provide the security, uh, provide at least the confidentiality part of the security. You have to enable that. But I think most people who are using IPsec are using it for encryption. And the last one on our list, SSH. And as I already mentioned, SSH is Secure Shell. That is the terminal console that you could use instead of Telnet. You should be using this instead of Telnet to be able to do this. My latest build of Mac OS I use doesn't even include Telnet. They don't even give it to you. I had to go out to a third party source to install Telnet on my operating system because Apple and everyone else knows don't use Telnet. Use SSH instead. And they're right. I just happen to have a device that only use, uses uh, Telnet. Can you believe it? It was the power system from last week that wasn't working. I was up on the ladder last week, which nobody saw because I had to do that before we started the cameras. And that device that I use, which is an APC power device that I access over IP, wasn't working. So I had to put a new one in. And the new one did not have SSH enabled by default. I had to use Telnet. So that's one of those things. Hopefully, you know these protocols. You need to know what protocols are secure and what protocols are insecure for your exam. Make sure you understand them. There are more protocols that you need to know. You will find all of them in your CompTIA exam objectives. So we're through our performance-based questions of the month. Let's go to some multiple choice questions. I've got one for you right now. And this multiple choice question asks, which of the following would be the best reason for implementing a DTLS VPN? Somebody mentioned earlier in the chat room as in that last question, boy, you really need to know your acronyms, don't you? Not only do you need to know your acronyms, you need to understand how these acronyms are used. The, the exam is not going to tell you uh, or ask you, please tell me what DTLS is. Tell me what that stands for. They're not going to ask you what it stands for. So if you're spending a lot of time with flashcards trying to figure out what the names are, ultimately it doesn't matter that much. What you really need to know is what does that do? How do you implement it? How is it used? And this is a pretty good question about how it's used. Which of the following would be the best reason for implementing a DTLS VPN? Would it be A, some applications do not use secure protocols? B, most of the VPN connections are over mobile data links. C, is much of the VPN traffic is VoIP conversations. D, is that the VPN users are not configured for 2FA. And E is that some VPN users will congest the link with large file transfers. Now, if you think you know this, do not answer in the chat room. Do not give any hints in the chat room. You want to go to professormesser.com slash QA. And that is where you'll be able to answer this question and see all of the possible answers. Click the one you think is the right one. 
This is one wherever I start putting these things together. Uh, this is where I really like to get into the details of what are these technologies so that you can become more familiar with the technologies that you can find. And DT DTLS VPN is another one of those that is important to know. That is something that is unique to the N10007. I don't believe DT DTLS VPN is on the N10006. So this is definitely a 007 question. Let's see how we've done with the DTLS VPN. I think most of you are realizing, wow, this is one I haven't run into before because we're we got a mixed bag of answers coming in. I try to jump in to these questions to determine uh, how can I get half of you getting this right and half of you getting this wrong. Uh, but that's that's one of those. So some of you are studying for the 006. Don't worry, you're not going to run into this on your 006 exam. So we can see that 36% of you have chosen A, some applications do not use secure protocols. 23% have said most of the VPN connections are over mobile data links. 17% and 16%, kind of a tie for third, is C, much of the VPN traffic is VoIP conversations. And E, some VPN users will congest the link with large file transfers. And only 8% said the VPN users are not configured for two-factor authentication. That's what that 2FA is that you will often see is two-factor authentication, this multi-factor functionality. And some of you have even said, I have no idea. I just took a guess. Good for you. In fact, that's what you should do on the exam, by the way, is you're not penalized for getting a question wrong. You obviously don't earn any points for getting a question wrong, but they don't take points away from you. So it doesn't hurt to guess on the exam. Don't leave any questions blank on the exam. If you're running out of time, make everything A that you haven't answered. Or make uh, do the Christmas tree. Do whatever you can, but fill those in. Do not leave them blank. You would at least have a chance for getting them right. Let's talk about a DTLS VPN. DTLS is the Datagram Transport Layer Security. Datagrams. Why? What are datagrams? Uh, DTLS pretty useful to have this here. Most of us are familiar with using VPNs. We use them for providing encryption and protection of data that we're sending from one site to another. Useful to have that. We use these technologies all the time. One of the challenges you have, though, is many of the VPN technologies are built around TCP. And as we're familiar with, as we learn this in our Network Plus, TCP has a little bit of overhead associated with it so that we're able to keep all of the packets in a particular order and provide retransmissions if any of the packets are missing. So every time you send a packet or two or, or a section of packets to a device, that device has to send an acknowledgment back. Well, that's, that's great. If you need that functionality, that reordering and the ability to resend that traffic, but what if you are using an application that doesn't use or need any of those functions? What if you drop a packet you don't care? What if you are sending traffic through and if it doesn't get to the other end, you don't care? You don't have time to do a retransmission. For example, voice over IP, a perfect example, uh, or live streaming. If you lose a packet, you can't really rewind your voice conversation. You can't really rewind this particular live event. You just have to keep going. And so the DTLS VPN uses datagrams instead of using those TCP frames that are sending the traffic and requiring an acknowledgment. So that's one of the nice things about DTLS is that it's a VPN type that has been optimized for streaming traffic or voice over IP traffic. So that becomes very useful for people that are using those types of technologies over a VPN connection. And if we look at the possible answers that we have, if much of the VPN traffic is voice over IP conversations, that would be C. Only 16% of you chose that one, but that would be the best reason for implementing a DTLS VPN in this question. Now, you're going to see this, by the way, on the actual exam, is that a number of these answers could have been correct. For example, if some applications don't use secure protocols, well, that's why you'd use a VPN, isn't it? Well, of course it is. But that wasn't the question. The question asked the best reason for implementing a DTLS VPN. So everything has to be considered. And that best reason means that you have to find the best answer. 
that is in this list. And although a VPN is useful because some applications may not use secure protocols, the, re the DTLS VPN specifically is designed for voice over IP and streaming conversations. That's the one we should have chosen in this particular example. Uh, most of the VPN connections over mobile data links, I guess if you have limited bandwidth, that's not what a DTLS VPN is designed for. A VPN user is not configured for two-factor authentication. DTLS has nothing to do with two-factor authentication. And some VPN users congesting the link with large file transfers, that sounds like a case where you would need quality of service not the case where you would need DTLS to provide that streaming or voice over IP optimization. So hopefully, we've learned something. Although only 17% of us got this one right, now we know all about DTLS VPNs. And if you happen to see that on your 007 exam, you'll know what they're talking about. Let's move on to another question. I've got another multiple choice here waiting for you. Here is the question. Which of these would be the best way to verify that a downloaded file was not corrupted during the transfer? Now, I've got a few options for you. So which of these would be the best way to verify that a downloaded file was not corrupted during the transfer? Would it be A, check the file hash, B, compress the file after the download is complete, C, monitor the bandwidth utilization during the download, D is encrypt the file after the download is complete. And E is copy the file using the slash V option. So which of these would be the best way to verify that a downloaded file was not corrupted during the transfer? So the real question here is in, uh, or the real detail of this is in the question. So make sure you read through the question very specifically. I could almost choose two different options here. But only one of these is going to answer the, exact, the actual question that is here. So hopefully, you know this the answer to this. And if you do, you can go to professormester.com slash QA. So that way, you can choose which answer it is. In fact, I'm going to take a peek at how we're doing with this one. In fact, many of you may have done this before. It's uh, useful to know how to do this. If you're someone who is downloading something from the internet and you want to verify that the file was not corrupted during the transfer, how would you do that? That's one of those that does come in handy to be able to make that happen. This is one also, if you're, uh, if you're ever working with these large files, this does become useful. Imagine downloading an enormous file. It's taking you hours to download it. But did it really download correctly? It'd be nice to have a quick way to verify that, wouldn't it? I think I've given enough hints. So let's see how we did with this one. You can see that 83% of you, 82% of you have said, check the file hash. A lot of you just chose A, check the file hash, and just assume that would be the right answer. So the question uh, is, what's number two? Uh, second on our list is E, copy the file using the slash V option. 9% of you chose that one. 5% of you chose C, monitor the bandwidth utilization during the download. 3% of you chose D, encrypt the file transfer after the download is complete. And nobody chose compress the file after the download is complete. Well, file hashing, I'm going to have to go with the 82% of you that are here because file hashing is really the best way to make this happen. File hashing is a way that you can get a unique set of information, a, a message digest, we call this, uh, from anything, from a big bunch of files that you have downloaded, from an enormous file, maybe a little email message. You can put anything into this hashing function, and it outputs to you a string of text that represents a fingerprint of what it happened to look like. It's always a unique value, too. So the, that's an important consideration with these hashing algorithms is that if you input a certain type of input into the hash, you're going to get a unique hash value that nothing else would be able to create except that exact piece of information, that input that you put into the hashing algorithm. So this allows us to perform some checks and verifications. So if you have, uh, you go to a website like uh, I have, for instance, Ubuntu here. 
This is uh, the files that are out on the Ubuntu website, and they list all of the ISO files that are available for you to download. There's a desktop ISO, a server ISO, and you can see the different flavors. And then they add a hash value next to each one of those. Now, what you're able to do then is download whichever one of these ISOs you'd like. Let's say we want to download the, the desktop ISO that's there. After we download it on our local machine, we run exactly the same hashing program, same hashing algorithm to create the hash value. And then we compare the hash value that we got on our local machine with the hash value that's posted on the Ubuntu website. And if they match, then we know we downloaded the exact same file that exists on the Ubuntu website. And there was no problem with the, the file transfer. It's exactly the same binary that we had from the very beginning. That becomes pretty useful. So we know that if we run into a problem, one of the questions we're going to have is, is the, was the file downloaded properly? Yes, it was, because we checked the hash. So we can take that off of our list of being any type of problem with that particular file. So those of you that did answer the answer A, check the file hash, absolutely correct. Because the, the question asked the best way to verify that a downloaded file was not corrupted during the transfer. So this is a verification that occurs after the transfer is complete. There is a copy command, for those of you that answered E, copy the file using slash V. That copies it, but it doesn't give you any verification after the file transfer is done that everything worked the way you would expect. In this case, we want the best way to verify it. And we can verify it at any time. We can verify it days later, weeks later, years later by checking the file hash. And the 82% of you that chose that got it absolutely right. There's a lot of details in the Network Plus exam. Huge amounts of information. All of that information about hashing. There's a huge security section. There's information about those secure protocols. We have information about uh, fibers and coppers. Uh, subnetting information is in here. Extensive amount of details. Uh, of course, you should go through all of my videos and take notes. Some of you are, are very good note takers. Although if you're like me, you're probably not the best note taker in the world. And there's a lot of video there. There may not be enough time in the world for you to be able to take notes on every single video as it goes along. But that's OK. I've already created a set of notes for you. These are my course notes that are exactly the notes from my videos. Every bit of text, all of the graphics, all of the details are in these course notes. I think I have course notes up on my screen here. Here they are. So here's the course notes. I've got. Uh, uh, an index for all of these. This one is, I think, 66 pages long. And all of the details from every single video, all of the graphics, all of the displays, all of the things that I created are in these course notes. Not only do I have the digital version that you can purchase right now and download and put it on all of your mobile devices because it's a PDF file, but I've also got a physical version. So if you're somebody that likes a book, it's a nice thick book. Uh, with the 66, is it 66 pages? 66 pages of notes. And that's not counting the index and all of the information at the front, my introductory details. So if you're looking for a physical book, I created the physical book because Mrs. Professor Messer said she likes books. She doesn't like the digital version. She prefers reading and going through a physical version. And so she's right. So I created this as well. You could buy just the digital version. Or you could buy the physical version. And when you buy the physical version, I throw in the digital one for free. So that's a, a good bonus. You get both if you get the physical version. So you can download the physical, uh, download the digital one right now, and then I'll ship you this physical version. So you can have that there. You can find out all about that at professormesser.com slash npcn7 for Network Plus Course Note 7. If you're here live and watching, it's on the live page. There's links at the top for the 006 course notes and the 007 course notes. Make sure you get the right ones. Make sure you get the course notes that are the right ones for the exam that you plan on taking. That's a pretty important consideration. Thanks for your support, by the way, with these course notes. They help keep the lights on. They allow me to do live events like this one. Uh, it goes a very long way to keeping all of this going. So thank you so much for your ongoing support. Let's get back to the questions. Got another one for you. Which of these? would be the best way to minimize excessive jitter on a wired network. 
Which of these would be the best way to minimize excessive jitter on a wired network? Would it be A, configure STP? Would it be B, enable IPsec on the switch trunks? Would it be C, create separate VLANs for all users? Would it be D, enable jumbo frames? Or would it be E, enable QoS? One of these would be the best way to minimize excessive jitter on a wired network. Hopefully, you're with somebody who has had to deal with managing jitter on a wired network. If you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. You can learn more about excessive jitter and having those there as well. There is a lot of detail that you need to know for the Network Plus exam. So a lot of these terms that you're going to run into with the VPN technologies, the encryptions, the hashes, and things like jitter, you need to know about them. So uh, I've, of course, added some graphical views of jitter into my 007 videos. So you can actually visually see what we're talking about when we mean excessive jitter. We also talk about fixing cases of excessive jitter. That may be something you run into as well. I'm going to take a sneak peek, though, and see if we can find ways for you to, to minimize the excessive jitter. Yes, too much coffee. I'm a little jittery. Well, I think I might have some right now. Maybe I'll have excessive jitter before we're done with the study group today. So that's one of those things to work on. Let's see. I'll let a few more people answer this before we switch over to uh, the excessive jitter question. This is something if you're dealing with managing really any size network these days, Jitter is something you're really going to have to watch for and be able to manage because it could have a pretty significant impact on the way people use the network. Let's see how we did. We can see 60% of us said E, enable QoS. 18% of you said enable Jumbo Frames. 11% of you said create separate VLANs for all users. 9% said to configure STP. And only 1% said to enable IPsec on the switch trunks. So how would we enable or, or manage uh, to be able to minimize excessive jitter? That's, that's the real question. Uh, jitter is a big problem, especially for real-time protocols. Voice over IP, for example, is a significant issue. That's because if you're in a situation where you miss a packet or the packet comes in very late and you've missed that data, you can't rewind your real-time voice phone call to be able to do that. And we measure the time between frames, and we give that value a value of jitter. So that's that, that is what we refer to in jitter, which is the time that is occurring between frames. Uh, so we have this amount of time that's going by. And what we're hoping that we will see is all of the frames are coming through at a very even pace. We have a minimum amount of jitter between those particular frames. And if that's the way our network is going, then things are going very well. Where you run into problems is when you have a bunch of frames come through, there's a big gap, and then more frames come through, and another gap, and then more frames come through. So you end up having this choppy type of file transfer for what we would have hoped to have been a voice phone call coming in at a very even rate. And when that occurs, we have excessive jitter. This is not a case where we're buffering. There's no time to buffer. There's This is a real phone call. This is a live phone call. You're on the phone, and you miss some data. You can't really hold on and buffering. The person's still talking on the other side. They're trying to get this information to you. You can't rewind the phone call and go back. They're still waiting for you to respond to them. So anything that is real time, you have these particular concerns about jitter. Now, obviously, if this is not real time, you still have concerns about jitter. But if it's not real time, one of the things you'll notice if you start up a YouTube video or even the video you're watching now, there was a little buffering that took place. So you're actually seeing this a few seconds, probably 10 to 15 seconds after I'm actually saying it. It goes off to YouTube. They do some reconfigurations to the video. They send it down to you. They buffer up a few seconds. That way, if you run into problems with jitter or other issues with the transmission, they've got some time to fix it 
before you run out of real-time data. Well, so that's, uh, that's one of those scenarios. So live video isn't as live as you might think. Phone calls are live. That is, that is real live data. And that's the case where jitter is really going to become a problem. The way that you resolve jitter is just as many of you said, 62% of you said, you enable quality of service. Uh, that is one way to help minimize the impact of jitter on a network. The idea is that normally every protocol on the network has just as much right to the network as every other protocol. So if you are on a phone call, the person next to you could be doing an enormous file transfer and using up all of the bandwidth out to your internet connection that's also used by your voice over IP phone. And if they start using up all the bandwidth, now it's going to be difficult to get voice communication in. Your network administrator can configure quality of service that might limit just how much total traffic a file transfer might have through the network, leaving plenty more information, plenty more space available for a phone conversation. So quality of service can be a huge advantage to keep your data on this side of the network, keep your voice traffic on this side of the network, and everybody's going to play happy on the network. Why wouldn't it be enabling jumbo frames? Jumbo frames are a way that you could take the traditional 1500 byte Ethernet frame and you can extend it up to a size that's technically just over 9000 bytes of a frame. So you can send these enormous frames through the network. If anything, that might actually use up more bandwidth faster. That might actually cause more jitter for your voice communications because now you're sending huge amounts of traffic. Voice communication, by the way, are very small frames. They aren't even close to using 1,500 bytes. They're sending a little bit of information over a very rapid pace. Jumbo frames are commonly used for backups, where you're sending huge amounts of information, and you want to use as much of the network as possible. So uh, you would not want to enable jumbo frames to minimize jitter on the network. Creating separate VLANs for all users. Wouldn't that be nice if we had a separate VLAN for every single user? Unfortunately, VLANs aren't designed to scale that way. And it's extremely difficult to manage a single user on a single VLAN for all of your users. It's not practical at all. It's something that no one would do. And at the end of the day, it doesn't actually help jitter either. It's creating a separate VLAN doesn't solve our bandwidth and network utilization issue. We need something to manage that. And that's what quality of service does. 9% of you said configure spanning tree protocol, STP. Spanning tree protocol, of course, is the protocol we use on switches to prevent loops. Hopefully, you've configured spanning tree protocol on your network anyway. That way, if there is a, somebody plugs in a connection, creates a loop, it won't bring down your network. It had, has no effect, though, on the, the amount of traffic or how fast the traffic can come through the network. It's not going to minimize excessive jitter or have any impact on that jitter as well. And 1% of you said enable IPsec on the switch trunks. That switch connection between switches is probably pretty secure. It's probably in the same room. Security is probably not your, your most urgent concern with that. You generally don't configure IPsec on switch trunks because of that. And this also has no impact on jitter. This is not going to be helping us. In fact, how do we know that our, our problem with jitter has anything to do with a trunk connection anyway? May not. So that is not the best answer here either. And only 1% of you chose that one anyway. The best answer is indeed E, enable quality of service. That's the best way that you would enable or, or minimize the excessive amount of jitter on your network. Now, some of you are, are watching these. You've already got your Network Plus certification or your Security Plus or your A Plus certification. And you want to, to accumulate continuing education units. Some people also accumulate CEUs for other things as well, not even necessarily CompTIA uh, renewals. These days, most people, I realize, are using the CertMaster CE to do their renewals. If you haven't looked into that, you don't have to collect CEUs for three years. You don't have to pay CompTIA extra money. You spend about three to six hours doing the CertMaster CE, and you're renewed for three years. It's like magic. But some of you are still accumulating these CEUs. And if you are, you can use this process to receive a CEU from me. It's a one-hour webinar CEU in the webinar category from CompTIA. The way you would do that is you go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a link there that says Contact Us. 
uh, it's really contact me. It goes straight to my phone. And on that contact us, it will ask you for your name, your email address. Make sure you put those because I will be sending you back a, a reply email that certifies that you are watching this. So you have to make sure those are right. Some people don't put in the correct email address. You know, you're, you're being sneaky. You don't, you don't want to give away your email. Well, then I don't have a way to send you back the email. See how that works? In the text part of that form, it's going to ask you for some information there. Make sure you put that this is the June 2018 Network Plus study group. And somewhere in that message, you can put a message to me too because I'm reading all of these. Sit down in front of the TV and I send out the CEUs every week. Uh, you can put anything in there, but somewhere in there, put the word jitter. That's how I know you must have been watching up to this point. I think at this point in the study group, that will be a legitimate way to determine that you will watch this. And why wouldn't you stick around after this point anyway? This is compelling information, isn't it? So that's the way you would uh, earn that CEU. It takes me about a week to finally sit down, uh, turn on the television, I'm watching live PD. I type in all the information. I send you back a digitally signed email so you know it really came from me. And then also so you can't change the one to a 10 hours. See how, see how that works? So there's a bonus there for getting those pieces. That's how you can also earn your CEU. Let's do another question. Let's keep this, this going. I've got one here uh, that's all about Sam. Here's the question. Sam, a network administrator, is designing a WAN that connects to many different remote sites. She'd like to add a redundant link to each location. Which of these topologies would be the best choice? So Sam is a network administrator. She's designing a WAN that connects to many different locations, uh, many different remote sites. She would like to add redundant links to each remote location. Which of these topologies would be the best choice? Would it be star? Would it be dynamic? Would it be bus? Would it be mesh? Or would it be static? Sam has quite a bit of engineering to do on this network to add these redundant links. So she needs to design a star, a dynamic, a bus, a mesh, or a static network design. This is something that is in both the N10006 and the N10007. If you think you know what the answer is, go to professormesser.com slash QA. And you will be able to answer this question and help Sam design her network. This is uh, sort of the kind of conversational question you might see on the exam. There's not a lot of questions that say, how many subnets are in this? How many bits in the subnet mask? It's really one that's describing a scenario and then being able to answer based on the requirements of that particular scenario. So that's one that does come in uh, does come in handy. If you happen to know those things, if you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. You indeed will be able to answer this as well. I'm going to take a sneak peek. I get to see which ones these are. If you've ever designed a network, then you've probably done this. If you have not designed a network, there are certain types of topologies in the CompTIA exam objectives. Each one of those topology types has advantages and disadvantages associated with them. You should learn more about what those topologies are and how they're used and how maybe they're used practically. Because each one of these types that, that are in those exam objectives have uh, some practical examples in, in actual use. So uh, this is a very good example of this because many organizations have wide area networks that span around the world and they want to be able to have some redundancy. So if one link disappears, they still have a way to communicate back to the main site. So this can be a little useful to have that there. Hopefully that's one you've, you've become accustomed to, to working with when you go through the exam objectives. Let's see how we did with this one. Which would be the best choice? Well, 76% of you said the best choice was D mesh. 10% of you chose B, which is dynamic. 8% chose star. 3% chose bus. And 2% chose static. So you've got uh, really double digits only for mesh and dynamic. But mesh, 77% of you chose mesh. It seems like that would be 
the logical one, and indeed it is. That is the one that would allow us to have some redundancy. Mesh implies that there are multiple links to get back to the same location. This is very common to do uh, if you have a site that is extremely important uh, or you need some redundancy. You might have one link go back to corporate and another link go to another remote site, which then also connects back to corporate. So it puts an extra hop into the link. But if you lose that main connection, now you can simply hop through the other remote site to be able to communicate back to the central facility. There's lots of ways to build redundancy in an WAN. This is simply one way to do it. Um, a lot of different requirements on engineering wide area network communication and a lot of different ways to engineer redundancy in a wide area network. But if you need that redundancy always on and being able to communicate, in fact, some people take it to the nth degree that they will build out a meshed network. They'll take one wide area network through one wide area network provider out one side of the building and another wide area network provider with a wide area network link out the other side of the building. That way, if somebody is digging outside and they dig up your wide area network wire, you still got the other side of the building to have that. It's one of the challenges we have, for instance, in Florida. Uh, if you're in South Florida, there's only so many ways to get out of the state of Florida. So a lot of wide area network providers have built wide area network fiber that go around the edges, the east and west sides of the state. But then you also run into problems with hurricanes and flooding. So do we also put one up the middle of the state? You know, running that much fiber is expensive. So we, it depends. Your geography has a lot to do with how you handle redundancy and engineering of wide area network connections. So that's uh, that's one of those that that does this. Now, one of the, the questions that uh, we had here, we had 11% uh, of you said dynamic. You know, dynamic is, is not a topology. So already I just sort of threw that one in as a red herring. But a dynamic network is really referring to routing protocols. That's really the only time you talk about a network being dynamic is the routing protocols are dynamic. So if something changes, the routing protocols will update all of the routers so that they understand what the changes were to the network and they can now resolve and be able to send traffic where they need to send it. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily add any redundancy. It just adds an automation to the routing. Uh, if you lose a connection to the main site, even if it's dynamically routed, the routers will realize the link is not there anymore and they won't send traffic down that link, but you still don't have traffic getting back to the main site. So dynamic would not be the right answer either. A star network does not have redundancy. A bus network certainly does not add redundancy. And a static network, again, is really referring to routing protocols, not really topologies. Another red herring, but only 2% of you chose that one anyway. So hopefully that was one that you were able to step through with your your dynamic and static and realize those aren't those aren't routing protocols. That's not something you could do. Some people in the chat room have been saying hybrid. What about hybrid? Well, hybrid is when you're combining different types of topologies together. So you might have part of the network is in a mesh, part of the network is in a ring, part of the network is in a bus, part of the network is in uh, a, a, a star. So you've kind of combined a lot of these together. That doesn't inherently provide you with any redundancy either. You know, those don't work that way. And of course, we got people in the chat room that are uh, that are that are saying, "What about token ring?" Yeah, token ring's definitely not redundant. No token ring there. And being able to do that, there's really no redundancy that's legitimate dealing with token. I guess there is if you look at the way that uh, the beacon works and the mouths they redirect, and you have a anyway. The part of the problem you have with token ring doesn't exist anymore. Can't find it. So that's why you also don't see it in your exam objectives for 006 or 007. One of the things you always run into when working through these exams is that it can be difficult to work and understand this at a practical level. Sometimes it's useful to work through a lab. And that's why the folks at GTS Learning have their practice labs for Network Plus, their latest practice labs for the Network Plus 007 you can find at professormesser.com slash netlab7. Make sure you use that link to have the discount automatically applied into their live labs. They also include their book and the, the same book I use to help create these videos. And they also include 200 questions for Network Plus. 
as well. It all runs in a browser. It's a virtual environment. You can do whatever you want. It's not on Rails. So you don't have to do the first thing and the second thing and the third thing. You can connect to the lab and just try different things. You can move anywhere you'd like. It's a completely virtual environment. If you don't like what you're doing, you hit a button, the whole thing resets. It's a beautiful thing. And special pricing if you follow that link. There's also pricing for the 006 exam as well. You can find that if you go to the Professor Messer website. There's a pull-down menu for Network Plus, and all of my study resources are on one page you can find. And the study resources for these live labs are there as well. Instead of paying $169 that you would pay on the GTS Learning website, special pricing for you for $109. It's a great thing to use if you want some extra stick time. You want some extra hands-on. You need some extra practical knowledge about networking. They've got plenty of labs available. That will step you through all of that. There's a big explanation of what all of the labs are. They even got some nice videos you can follow along right there at that link, professormesser.com slash netlabs7. Netlab7. We've got time for another question, right? I've got one for you. This is another, well, not really a performance-based question, but not the typical question you would run into. This is more of a visual daily double. And in fact, I don't think I even asked you for multiple choice. This is a fill in the blank. So I think we can qualify this as a performance-based question. What is the name of this connector? Very specific question here. What's the name of this connector? Now, obviously, on the podcast, you're not going to be able to follow along with this very well. You're not going to be able to see this. If you think you know the answer, you don't want to answer in the chat room, you want to go to professormesser.com slash QA and answer the question there. Make sure that you do that instead of talking in the chat room. We don't want to mention what this happens to be, and I would hate to have to remove people from the chat room. That's That doesn't help anybody. So maybe one of these that you're working through, trying to figure out what these different types of connectors are, these are important. In fact, you will be, in, it's very common. Let me make a bigger picture of this for those who are watching. Very common for you to be able to, to plug into uh, a network or view the back of a network, network router, a switch, and these network devices you will see all kinds of connectors suddenly in front of you. And you need to understand what you're looking at. You need to understand how these are plugging in. And so I've got uh, the, act, the questions that are coming in. Make sure you know what those are. In fact, I'm asking you very specifically, can we back go back one? I think we can. What's the name of the connector? I'm not asking you about the name of the cable. So there's your hint. A lot of you are giving me the name of the cable. I don't want the name of the cable. I want the name of the connector that's on the end of the cable. <laughs> Some of you are like, oops, oh, oh, is that, got to read those questions. That is an important one for the exam. It's a challenge because you're trying to go through this exam as fast as you can. And one of the things I do, I go through exam very, very quickly, and I'm just kind of reading, 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 putting an answer and going to the next one. What I try to do at the end of my exams I try to have enough time so I can go all the way back to the beginning and then read slower through the questions. And so I, I this obviously I only do this on CompTIA. You can't do it on things like Cisco. Cisco exams go to this question. When you hit submit, you can never go back to that question again. So that's one where the CompTIA is kind of nice because I can go back and then slowly read through. I feel like I've gotten through as much as I can. And sometimes I miss a, a word. Sometimes I miss the word not which completely changes the answers that I would give on the question. So make sure that you read through these questions as well and you aren't missing any of it like this one that asks, what's the name of this connector? What is it? What is it? Well, we've got a few folks that have answered this one that have that are come through. Now, fortunately, and one of the things I've noticed, CompTIA is kind of moving away from using those not questions. Uh, which of these are not this type of thing, or which of these accept this type of thing? I've noticed they're not doing so much of that. Those are just they they they're they're foolish questions. They're not they're they're almost tricky in the way they're being asked. They're obviously not trick questions, but they're confusing when you're switching back and forth between questions that are asking you for a positive response and questions that are asking you for a negative response, which is crazy. So, what type of connector is this then? It's a lot of you are answering coax. That's the type of cable 
that is in here. That is not the right answer. Some of you have said BNC. It is not a BNC. Some of you have said, uh, even giving me the type of coax, the RG58 is the type. I don't care about the coax. That wasn't the question. The question was specifically about the connector. And the connector is an F connector. So some of you working through these. This F connector is one that we most commonly see these days in something like cable television. And of course, cable modem, digital cable technology. It's not even cable television anymore. It's cable digital network delivery because our video is now over digital. Our, our internet connections are obviously digital. Our voice communication is digital. It's digital delivery over one wire. How do they do that? How does that work? It's like magic. And they keep making it faster and faster. Although they've kind of hit the end. They've kind of hit the edge of what they're able to do with sending all of this digital information over one piece of copper that's inside the middle of that coax connection. Uh, this is, in this particular case, RG6. Uh, it could be RG59 types that are being used. The F connector, though, is a threaded connector. It's not coming out. Uh, let's have a better look at this. So you can see the threads that are inside of it. You push it onto the connector and you twist it, and you twist it, and you twist it, and then you pull it off. It, it never got started. Let me put it back on. You twist it, and you twist it, and, you twi and then it, it's not straight. You have to get straight, and you twist it, and you twist it, twist it, and finally it's twisted on there, and you finally got it started right with the threads. What's nice about the F connector, it's not coming off. Uh, in fact, I hate the people that then get a wrench and just tighten it up because I will never be able to get it back off of this again. Um, just finger tight is good. That's all you need to do. Tightening over the wrench doesn't help. Uh, finger tight is good, and it's not coming off because you have to twist it five or six times for it to come off of that connection. So it's a very safe type of connection, very useful in environments where you're worried about it pulling out. So uh, the, the cable companies don't want people calling them and saying, uh, my, my video went out. My, my microphone went out. My video went out. Uh, and then because the, the cable popped off. The cables don't pop off when it's an F connector. And they don't pop off when it's a B and C either. Uh, that B and C uh, is, is one that plugs in and twists a half turn, a quarter turn. Um, and then it is stuck there as well. That's another good one. But this is not a B and C. You can see by the threads. This is definitely an F connector. And that's how you would know the difference. Uh, the, the BNC has that connection that has the small connectors on the side that open up so it locks in place to have those there. And that would be the F connector. So I, I, we don't have, because this was a fill in the blank, I don't have a percentage of you that said F connectors. A number of you said BNC. A number, some of you said the twisty one. And I'll give you credit. I'm giving credit for the twisty one. No, I'm not. Doesn't work that way. Um, a lot of you, though, did say F connector. Some of you said F connector coax. So I'll take I'll take the anything you put an F connector, an F type, an F in there somewhere, you got it right. It was not coax. It was not BNC. Um, it was definitely the F connector. That's what we were looking for on this one. Hopefully, it's one that you were able to find on this one as well. Well, we've gotten through, gotten through an hour of questions. How is that possible? That went through pretty quick. And for those of you that are studying for the exam, though, make sure you download the exam objectives. Pretty important to have this here. The exam objectives from CompTIA are comprehensive. They should be the first place you start on your studies. They should be the last thing that you look at before you walk into the exam because they make a great checklist. I use these exam objectives to build my videos. You'll be able to find that all of my videos are numbered exactly the same as these exam objectives. It's very easy to find information that way. Not all books are set up that way, but usually a book is able to has a cross tabulation in there that will cross tabulate. Chapter three is referring to section four dot two, so you'll be able to figure it out in your book that's there. Make sure you get those. You can download them by going to the Google machine and typing in CompTIA exam objectives, or simply go to professormesser.com/objectives to be able to get those. Incredibly important to have that there. I do one of these every month. So you have uh, this one this month. Notice it's a little bit late on this month. I'm going to quickly adjust some things on my screens here. 
we have this here. So uh, the, the next one that we're going to do, though, is also later on in July. Uh, we, we push things a week this month because I went on vacation for a week at the beginning of the month, and now I'm back. And, of course, at the beginning of July is July the 4th. So we're not going to do one the week of July the 4th. You can see that, that's, in fact, that's Wednesday. We don't want to do a study group on July the 4th. Nobody wants that. So A plus will be on the 11th. Network plus will be on the 18th. And then Security Plus will be on the 25th of next month. We're also doing Security Plus next week at this time. So if you like this, you want to do more of this with Security, it'll be next week this exact same time. Stick around for the next hour. I'm going to open up the phone lines. You can call in. You can ask me anything. You can say anything. You can. It doesn't even have to be about exams or certifications. We can talk about anything you'd like, almost anything you would like. So uh, also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. You can find that at professormesser.com slash Twitter. Follow me on YouTube, professormesser.com slash YouTube. It's professormesser.com slash the social media thing you would like me to find. So uh, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, it's there. Don't forget about the course notes, professormesser.com slash NPCN or NPCN7 for the version 7. And all the links are on the website if you want to find those as well. My thanks again to GTS Learning for their net labs, professormesser.com slash net labs or net labs 7 for the N10007 pieces. And of course, if this is well after July, you're trying to figure out when is the next event going to be, you can find all of that on my website at professormesser.com slash calendar. Thank you for being here for this first hour of Q&A. I'll thank you in advance for sticking around for the next hour. We'll open up the phone lines, but we really couldn't do this live Q&A if it was just me sitting in a room. That really wouldn't help very many people at all. So your participation is not only needed, it's very much appreciated. Thank you for being here. Stick around for hour two, but if you have to leave, I, I can understand. But uh, you'll always have a replay available on the website to come to. Thanks for joining us this time. We will see you next time on the Network Plus Study Group. Oh, I already gave out the webinar credit information. I already gave out those things. I missed it. You have to go back and figure out the details. Let's get the phone lines up and running. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this myself. I'm the only one here. So let's turn some audio on so I can hear things. And we'll get the phone number up in just a moment as soon as I get a phone line going. Uh, let's see. I need Skype. I need to call in with Skype and get that going. I don't understand how to use Skype anymore because apparently it's all changed. There we go. Doop, 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 doop. Thank you for calling. Well, you're studio. welcome. Uh, and I need to pull up a number thing and I need to type in a thing there. And then uh, have the other stuff here, and then it will say. Enter your six-digit PIN number. Well, that's that's redundant. Uh, let's try it though. Um, and then I, I need to change my PIN so that it's easier to type in every month. Wouldn't that make a lot of sense? Welcome. To Welcome. Us. So you are glad now that in worked. Your room and can manage your call well, I know I can. Studio. You're talk. That's a. You're very in, very in, talking quite a bit. So here's your phone number if you'd like to call in. It's a, a toll-free number anywhere in the continental United States. You can call in at 855-785-RJ45. And if you are outside of the continental United States, which some of you have already mentioned that you are, you can use Skype and call me absolutely free. I have paid for the Skype minutes. You don't have to pay anything. You simply put a plus one at the beginning and use the same number, plus one, 855-785-7545. And you can call in as well to get all of those things um, available uh, on the website. So I've got quite a, quite a lot to go through. We've already got some folks calling in. I don't want to leave you on hold very long. But we've got uh, a lot of things happening. I mentioned in the pre-show, I've got 1080p streaming Maybe as early as next week. It depends on how the shipping is. I don't think it's shipped yet, so it's probably going to be in July. Hopefully, I'll start having 1080p, which means I'm now I'm only five years behind with my streaming. There's a lot of reasons for that. 
Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to give you some options for even better, clearer, nicer video on your, your piece. Why aren't we doing 4K? We should be doing 4K streaming. I've already thought of that. I'm already working. That's a longer thing. Do you really want to see me in 4K? I'm not even sure if that would be a good idea anyway. So that's maybe that's a question for some other time. Let's go to the phone lines, though. We've got the 678 area code calling. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello, it's Matt. Hey, welcome. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Um, so I have a question. Um, so I know the uh, 106 is ending, I believe, the end of August. Correct. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and I wanted to take the 106, but I don't think I'm going to be ready in time. Um, how much difference is there between the 106 and 107? So, like, for example, I have two 106 Network Plus books, one from CompTIA, one from, I think, Mike Myers. Um, and I've been studying them for months on, on and off. You know, I got a new job, so I haven't had a chance to get back into studying, but I'm working my way back into it. So I don't feel I'll probably be ready before it's over. So what's the overlay in terms of, like, trying to do the 107 versus the 106? Well, there's, there's good news and bad news along those lines. I think the exams are very similar in style and in structure and in content because networking content doesn't, sen doesn't tend to change as rapidly as operating systems or as, uh, as, as having um, maybe security type content. But there are some significant changes to the content between 006 and 007. I mentioned this uh, early in the study group. But let's do it again. As I went through the 007 exam objectives, and there are 499 objectives by the way I count, which may not necessarily be the way everyone counts, but that's a pretty good number to go with, is about 500 exam objectives. Of that, 171 of those are brand new to the 007 exam. So if you're studying from the 006 books, there are about 35% of the exam objectives are missing from your 006 books. There's about 35% of the content that's brand new on the 007 exam. And some of the content that's on the 007 exam, uh, they, they removed from the, zero, the, from the old 006 days. So there's some content that you're not going to find that you're studying. And suddenly you get to the 007, you didn't even need to study it. So there, there is, a, there is a, a, a lot of overlap, obviously. If it's only 35%, you've got 65% of the exam that's similar content or somewhere close to it, probably close to 60. But there's that 35%. And that's the one that is a, that's a pretty significant number. So if you, if you don't have the option of getting 007 books and studying from 007 materials, if you're planning to take the 007, then I highly recommend that you use the 007 exam objectives as your checklist. And it will be very obvious as you're going through that checklist exactly which topics are new on the 007 exam and which topics are old. And I've mentioned this before, and I really need to do this, is put a list of these on the website. And, and I, I think I can do this with uh, the CompTIA. I don't know if I can do this with the CompTIA exam objectives or not. Uh, the exam objectives that CompTIA provides, um, I went through and I documented in the exam objectives which ones are new and which ones are old. So uh, I'll give you an example. You folks can see this who are watching live. Is in the exam objectives, this is not the full and complete set, but I would go through it. Anything that is uh, the same, I tag with green, and anything that is new is yellow. And so you can see there are some sections of this that are that are very yellow and other sections of this that are very green, but they're very interspersed. So it won't be obvious because you'll be going through learning about the DNS service and you're learning about the A records and the MX records and the CNAME records, and then you won't realize, wait, the text records and the SRV records and the NS records are new. They kind of mix them all in. There's new stuff in the existing ones, so it's not obvious just by looking at it, which ones might be there and which ones are new and which ones are old. So use those exam objectives if you don't have a choice. Your best bet, though, is just buy uh, a new book. Books, generally speaking, relatively speaking, books aren't horribly expensive. And it's going to give you the best bet 
for passing that exam. So hopefully that's that gives you some overview. Now, based on that, what do you think you'll do? Do you think you'll grab the exam objectives and just use those as your checklist? I mean, I still have right because it, it's at the end of August, correct? Correct. You've got August thirty first. Okay, so I'll probably I mean, so that's like a roughly about six weeks from now. So, I mean, if I, I have enough of, of understanding now where I'm fairly confident, so if I just you know give a good two three weeks of like you know putting good work, I believe I can try to get it. But just in case I do not pass, I want to at least know. You know okay, well, I need to start looking into the next one just in case. It's, uh, it's going to be a short period of time. Good. It'll be incremental for you. So, so uh, there. Trust me, there will be people taking this exam on the last day it's offered. They 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 talk to me all the time. There's people that are planning to do it, and and you got six weeks. You've already gone through a good set of it. You're probably well positioned to pass the exam if you if you really go through the exam objectives, study up, and be ready for it. Um, and you might even want to do it a week before. And then you might even want to consider if you run into a problem and you fall a little bit short, you could do some quick cramming, go right back in before it's retired and end up passing it before they retire the exam. But even if you have to go, even if you miss it for some reason and you have to move into the 007, there's only 35% difference between the two. That's not overwhelming. You're not starting from ground zero. A lot of this is going to be very similar and very familiar to you. Yeah, I got it. Uh, I, I appreciate it. That's pretty much what I was thinking myself, too. It's a good strategy. I wish you best of luck, sir. All right, thank you. That's, uh, I think that's a strategy a lot of people are using. I think a lot of people are going to be going into this exam, trying to get it done before it's retired, which is a great idea because once you're certified, you're certified. You don't have to take any more tests. You just wait three years and you know, take the Cert Master CE and renew it for another three years. It's that simple. Uh, things you can do with that. Let's go to uh, the phones to the 202 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is DeAndre. I'm calling from D.C. Oh, welcome. What can we do for you? Um, I just wanted a couple advice as far as um, studying for the Network Plus. Um, my deadline for the Network Plus is October 1st, and my I have a, another test coming up for the Security Plus, and that deadline is December 1st. And I just started studying for the Network Plus, and I decided I'm going to take the 007. Good. I think that would be the safest route. Yep. Um, in between then, I wanted to know, what does uh, Indigo Vision um, have to do with uh, Network Plus or Security Plus as well? I'm not, I'm not sure what you said there. What does what, does what have to do with it? Indigo Vision not familiar with with that i'm or i'm missing completely what you're what you're saying with that I'm, is this something from the exam objectives or is this something else that you're referring to uh this is actually something else so um the, my main question is how could i go about uh studying for the network plus if my deadline is october 1st it's it's for the uh, well, fortunately, you've already said you're going to stick with the 007. So that's that's already great mm -hmm. to have that that plan because if you went with the 006, it obviously is going to be retired on August 31st and it will no longer be around anymore. So that's that's one of the challenges yeah. you have is just time. By choosing the 007, you you get rid of a whole lot of pressure that's put on the amount of time you have to study because there's only like the last mm -hmm. caller said about 6 weeks left and you're going to be done with uh, with your time. You're out of time already. Um, so well, that's the challenge is thirty days after that. I have the net, uh, security plus as well. Yeah, so you've got a... My goal was to finish the network plus before October first. Okay, that that's that is first a remarkably aggressive schedule. Uh, most people that are on my site tend to take somewhere around three to six months to study for both of these. Now, you could, of course, accelerate that by just sitting down every day and studying all of this. A lot of people, that three to six month time frame is three to six months with everything else in their life going on at the same time. And some people have more time to study than others. So you've got some differences in, in how you study and maybe what you study and having those things available. Um, but it's one yeah. month. The study is really aggressive. Now, fortunately, some of the Network Plus content 
does overlap into the Security Plus. So a lot of the things that you'll be learning about protocols, a lot of the things you learn about what protocols are secure, some of the things about hashing and encryption that are in the Network Plus are also covered in the Security Plus, although I would say they're covered into a much larger degree. But at least you've already learned mm -hmm. that, that fundamental part of it, and you can kind of slide into the Security Plus side of things. There have been people on my site, though, that have studied for two weeks, walked in, and they passed the exam. Now these are people that had wow. uh, that had uh, other types of knowledge. They had other experience. They had things they could apply to that, and they had a lot of time to study. But it is possible. So uh, you still have some advantages there. As long as you, my recommendation for you, since you mentioned strategies, is to use those exam objectives. You're going to need to be very focused. You're going to need to study exactly what's on the exam objectives. You're going to make sure that you don't want to go outside the scope of the exam objectives because that's wasted time on your studies. CompTIA stays very, mm -hmm. very, very close to these exam objectives. If you know and understand mm -hmm. everything that's in these exam objectives, you're going to do just fine on the exam. So use those as your checklist. Mm -hmm. Cross it out once you know it. Go to the next one. Circle the things you need to go through more. Use whatever method you need to use to use that as your checklist. And, and that will keep you on target and focused to be able to do that in, the, in the, the very fastest, the quickest amount of time. So you say I could utilize my objectives. How could I utilize um, it at work as well if I'm working in the field, a well, network field? Well, this is even better because now you have – um, in many environments, like uh, an organization already has a lab. You already have professionals in these organizations. You probably have a security team. You probably have a network team. Yes. So if you run into a challenge with these questions that you're getting, and it's going through IPsec, and it's asking you about phase one and phase two, and you just can't conceptually figure out what are they talking about, you've got people you can walk up to and say, What's this about? They're like, oh, let me tell you. And here's how we use it. And here's how we're connecting our sites together. And here's how we do the encryption. And here's how these two routers talk to each other and build an IPsec tunnel. So you've got some, mm -hmm. you've got some practical use. Those synapses will fire in your brain, and you'll know exactly how those particular technologies are applied in the real world. That's a very valuable thing to have available. Not everyone has that resource. Yes. My last question is: How would you do? How would you manage your time? Um, I'm very bad at time management, and I feel like that's going to be a, a number one key to have. It's uh, That is the, the magic question because everybody – studies differently. Everybody's able to have different types of time schedules available. Some people prefer studying in the morning before everybody wakes up. Some people prefer waiting till everyone goes to bed and so they have complete silence. Some people are just have uh, the time when they are traveling to work. They're on the train. They're in their car. And they do that for hours a day. There's different places where you're able to pick those up. And this may be an opportunity, although I don't have any specific uh, apps that that could help. There's a ton of different apps available online so that if you're mm -hmm. standing in line waiting to order lunch, you could do a couple of questions mm -hmm. from a Q&A. &A. That's a good way to, at any point during the day, start cramming those things mm -hmm. in there. You know, If you had more time and a very dedicated and the, nobody in the house, you could sit in the apartment and, and study these things. It's a lot easier, but not everybody has that luxury. But definitely go over all of my Network Plus objectives before even touching Security Plus. I would recommend that you really focus on one of these at a time. Uh, the you know, faster you're going to be through Network Plus and take that exam, the faster you'll be able to transition into Security Plus. There's not that much overlap between the two. And I could not imagine mm -hmm. studying for both of those simultaneously. They are both very, very big certifications to study for. I'd recommend one at a time. Would you recommend them getting the bundle pack as well in case of um, not passing the network bus for the first time? Well, that's kind of up to you. You may already have experience with CompTIA exams. Uh, you may already, you may think, I don't have a lot of time to study. This is going to be a challenge. Maybe I want to use that additional insurance. I'm very big on mm -hmm. insurance. Uh, if somebody says, do you mm -hmm. want the insurance? Uh, I'm usually saying, yes, I want the travel insurance. I want the car insurance, my house insured, my health. I, I over-insure everything because I'm always expecting the worst. Maybe you're you're someone who feels more comfortable and it takes a level of stress 
off of your initial mm -hmm. exam. And sometimes people, they complain mm -hmm. like, oh, I paid for the extra exam and now I don't need it. But maybe paying for the extra exam allowed you to relax enough to pass the first time. So maybe maybe that's the better better way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for calling, DeAndre. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. That's that's a challenge. Uh, everybody studies differently, so there's no one way to go about doing that. But uh, that's that's really the question and how we how we focus on those things. Back to the phones. The seven five seven area code. Thanks for holding for so long. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Bert from Yorktown. Hey, Bert. Welcome. What can we do for you? Thanks, Doc. Let me first say uh, a big thank you to you for all the work you do and trying to make us smarter out here. My pleasure, sir. What can we do? Uh, how can we help you? Uh, well, let's hope we can make you smarter today. What can we do? Well, I hope so. Um, I've, uh, I've, t I've taken and passed uh, both parts of the A+. Plus, nice. And I'm working on Network Plus now. Good for you. Um, and so my question uh, pertains to the performance-based questions yeah. at the beginning of the exam. And uh, I re recall having a question where it was command um, line oriented. Sure. And uh, you had to come up with the right command and work through a couple progressions of using it uh, and then complete the question, of course. And so what I was wondering was if I start to work that problem, and let's say I use the wrong command, like trace route instead of ping or DNS lookup. Right. And then I realize as I'm working it, oh, I've got the wrong command. Let me jump back and use the right command. And that right command then gets me to the next level of the, of the step that in order to finish the question. What I'm wondering is, am I penalized for that? Or is the fact that I did eventually get to the right step and pass that, that, that intermediate step, does that still allow me to, to score you know, maximum on the question. According to CompTIA, they aren't concerned with the journey. They're only concerned with the destination. They're, they're going to give you an objective for you to get to. And according to what they have said publicly, they don't care how you get there. They don't care if you try every single command in the world and then finally ah. choose the right command that gets you to the resolution that they asked for in the question. If you do that, you get full points for the question, according to what they have said. So uh, uh, that's awesome. good because then you can you can try a lot of things, and as long as ultimately you end up at that final spot they wanted you to end up, that's all they care about. Great, yes. great. I wasn't a hundred percent sure on that, and I just wanted to bounce that off you. Thank you. And they have they have said, by the way, publicly that some of these performance based questions give partial credit although they've said they've said in the past very very few of them very rarely do you get partial credit on the performance based questions they've said more recently mm -hmm. that more of them give you partial credit but don't expect it uh, usually it's an all or nothing so i think their objective is to try to see if you can get to the final point and then they don't have to worry about uh, uh, different points that you might be getting in between. Concentrate on the end goal. I think you're going to be just fine. Roger that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Doc. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bert. That's, uh, that's a, a common question, too, because you never know. These performance-based questions, you don't know what you're going to get. Are they drag and drop? You're putting things in order. Are they fill in the blank? Are they like going to a command prompt and asking you to perform functions? How do they even know how you get there? As it turns out, they don't care how you get there, which is great. Back to the phones, 862 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, hey, um, this is Alan. I'm calling from Jersey. Hey, Alan, what can uh, we do for you? Present. Doing good. Uh, I've been following your network uh, study group. I uh, already got my A-plus cert. Nice. And, um, you know, trying to study for my network plus. Now, I want to know, for le for the comp to use, like, how – uh, cloud plus certifications in like Linux plus, even like Sura plus. Do you feel like I know you probably are very busy, you know, creating these study groups and uh, these videos? Is it? Um, do you feel like cloud plus and Linux, Linux, and the, those other certs that are offered by CompTIA are not as viewed strongly in um, you know, in the industry uh, as far as uh, you know, candidates looking for jobs? Is it? 
you know, I guess network plus, security plus, and A plus are kind of like um, the bread and butter. They're like the most, they're kind of held in a different standard as opposed to the other ones. And the other ones aren't as popular or common um, or, um, you know, employers are not looking for that as much. And I think that's, you kind of hit on what makes a, a certification valuable. Uh, the, the value of a certification is based on what you personally do with it. I think the content of the Cloud Plus and the content of the Linux Plus is very good content if you need to learn cloud technologies and if you need to learn Linux technologies. Uh, in fact, there's, there's part of uh, people that will say it's a waste of time to get these certifications. Um, but what if your goal to get the certifications is to become much more familiar with cloud-based technologies and become much more familiar and comfortable with Linux-based operating systems? Then already those certifications were very valuable to you. But a lot of people use these certifications for career use. You want to be able to get a job or get a better job. And so you have to see what are employers asking for. Some employers want to see a Linux Plus. Some employers want to see a Cloud Plus. Fortunately, these days, you have a way to go online to some of these popular online um, recruiting sites and job posting sites and do searches for these keywords. You can look for Cloud Plus. You can look for CompTIA. You can look for Linux Plus. And you can start to do your own research in your particular geography of what people are asking for. And, and it changes. If you're in one country versus another, those certifications have different values. Uh, it just depends on where you happen to be in the world and how people are, are using those certifications to help hire people. Um, what you're going to find, though, and you're right, A plus, Network plus, and Security plus, I think are so popular because those are core types of of certifications. Every network is going to have A plus type requirements. Everybody's organization is going to have a networking team with networking requirements. Every organization is going to have security requirements. Cloud plus is very niche in those cloud based technologies. Although these days everybody mm -hmm. tends to have cloud these days as well. And Linux, I would say every organization has at least some flavor of Linux inside of it. But some organizations are vastly large in Windows. Other organizations, maybe not so much. So Linux Plus is going to have a different value depending on what door you're walking into and to which organization. The real key is for you to be able, if you're using this for career use, is to know what people are looking for in your area. And sometimes finding that niche is just as valuable as maybe taking a more mainstream certification. Getting a Linux Plus is extremely valuable if you are going to work for Rackspace because they have a huge Linux section. If you're on ProfessorMesser.com, you're on a Linux machine, a series of Linux machines at Rackspace in their huge data center. And when I need help, I call on the phone and I get a Linux expert who knows everything about Linux and they know how to handle that operating system for me. And, and they're my IT team to be able to do that kind of thing. They're looking for people that have Linux knowledge. They're, they're not looking to put somebody in that seat who only knows Windows. So those are the scenarios where you really have to find the niche that works for you. Maybe it's not Cloud Plus. Maybe it's AWS from Amazon. Maybe it's VMware. Mm -hmm. uh, it just depends on what employers happen to have in their infrastructure and what they're hoping to find a knowledge base for out there and what they're willing to pay for for someone's salary, too. So it, you, you never exactly know what you're going to find. I see. OK. And the only other question I have is, um. The, so like even like for the like project plus which is for people who want to be project managers that's sure. also like a special niche in itself it is um the yeah yeah so the like as far i know comp is very vendor neutral and i know there's all their certs like the i thought about the mcsa for microsoft sure um you know cisco is very vendor specific but yep. then there's also uh but do you feel like i guess it's for vendor neutral like comptia it's kind of like, as far as entry level certifications, it's kind of viewed in high regard. Um, whether I have like a MCSA or like in uh, or a CompTIA Network Plus or A Plus, it, is it, it as far as entry level? Yeah, it, it's going to depend on who you talk to. Some employers. Hmm can appreciate the information provided on a CompTIA certification, and they know exactly what they're getting when they're hiring somebody. Or maybe they'd like to see a combination of that with 
a Microsoft or with a Linux or with a Cisco, depending on the job posting that they have. Um, it, it's difficult. Yeah. You, the, don't, uh, don't use the, the idea of vendor neutral as something that is necessarily required or looked for, because if you look at a Cisco certification, the vast majority of networks out there have Cisco equipment in them. They're, they're almost the de facto default for many organizations. Now, some don't have Cisco, but the things you learn when you get your Cisco certification can be easily applied to other manufacturers' technologies as well. So getting Cisco means that you're very well knowledgeable. You're very knowledgeable on the networking side of things. Um, now, obviously, Network Plus and a CCENT are vastly different certifications. They are hugely different. A lot of people like to combine these together. They're nothing like each other. So a mania, someone who's hiring may be trying to hire somebody who has a network level uh, bit of knowledge so they can put them on the network help desk or teach them as they go. Or maybe they need somebody who's very knowledgeable in Cisco out of the gate, and they're going to hire for that Cisco certification. You just need to look at those job postings and see what they're doing. And this may be the point where in your particular geography, maybe you want to attend a Microsoft user group meeting, a Cisco user group meeting. They're out there. And those are the people at those user group meetings who are using this technology every day. And perhaps more importantly, they are hiring people to be able to work on these technologies every day. It always helps if you do some people networking and be able to meet those people, get on their LinkedIn, make sure they know about you so that if they do have a job posting, they'll think, oh, yes, I know a person who'd be perfect for this. Let me contact him on LinkedIn and see if he wants to come in for an interview. That's a great way to get a job. It's a very common way these days. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. All right, Professor. Uh, that's, I think that's all I wanted to know. And I really appreciate your feedback. And, you know, thanks for all the videos again. Thanks, Alan. Best of luck. Yep. Take care. Bye-bye. That's, that's a pretty useful thing to do is to make friends in the industry. Um, uh, people like to hire people they know. And if they've already met you at a Cisco user group, they've already met you at a Microsoft user group, they met you at one of the security user groups that might be in your area, or it's a manufacturer, maybe a Palo Alto Networks or a Checkpoint for security. Those are valuable relationships to know. Uh, when I was working as a systems engineer for a firewall company, I visit three or four companies a day. So I would meet tons of people in geographical areas every day. And it'd be very common for them to send me an email and saying, I'm kind of looking around at uh, trying to move up to this other type of thing. Do you know someone in the area who's looking? So we almost became our own coconut telegraph where we'd be able to go, yeah, I was just in talking with someone else. They're hiring right now. And we could create a connection between all of these people that we knew. That comes in handy too. So a lot of people will they will discard or minimize the value of a manufacturer's representative coming in to talk to them. But I can speak at a technical level, the systems engineering level. Um, we like knowing all these people because we could actually be an intermediary between these two. We knew the people. When you go sit down in a meeting with someone, you're talking to them about technology, you know if they're good or not. You can start, it's almost like an interview. You can start to get a feel for their technical knowledge. And you can see them operate things at the command line. You can see what type of network they built. So when somebody, that person would come to me and say, is anybody hiring? I could say, oh, you would be perfect for this network over here. Because I had the luxury of going to all of these different places and seeing the networks and meeting the people and putting them into my contact list and keeping track of, of them and working with them a lot. We would put in evaluations. We would spend hours and hours on site with them, uh, showing them these products, demonstrating its capabilities, integrating it into the network, solving problems with them. Uh, it, and then sometimes you would meet great people. Sometimes you would meet people that weren't so great. And you put them in that category. Like, I wouldn't recommend you for a job anywhere if someone came to me. Uh, those are important things to know as well. So that's uh, that's something I would recommend too, is to, uh, is to find those people in your area. It can be very difficult when you're first starting out. So go to the user group meetings. They're open to everybody. There's pizza. Why wouldn't you go to that? Spend that, that is some very valuable time that you're investing in yourself. 
to be able to know what's going on. Especially in your area, you're meeting some of the pros in these meetings. I would go speak at these meetings to talk about the latest technology and security, what these uh, firewalls were doing. Uh, it's a great way to meet all of these people because they set up a section of the user group where everybody can just sit around and talk. Grab some pizza, sit down at a table. Hey, where do you work? What do you do? I haven't met you before. Yeah, I just got my Network Plus. I'm working towards. You guys hire people in Network Plus? Should I be looking at something else? They're going to tell you. They're happy to tell you. If you're trying to find a user group meeting, you can usually find specific ones by simply looking for Microsoft user group, Cisco user group, VMware user group. Um, but uh, meetup.com is a great place. A lot of organizations will post it on meetup.com for your particular geographical area. So that might be useful as well. That's uh, There's always a way to find the user group meetings. Send them a note. Say, I'm interested in attending the next one. How do I find you? Are you on Facebook? Are you on LinkedIn? Where's your main page? Do you have your own website? They'll tell you. You can find them. And then you start building that uh, Rolodex. Is that a, that a term that's even used anymore? You start building that contact list of all of those things so that you can, if you run into a scenario where you need help, there have been times where I was working with this firewall company and we, I'm in Florida, but they said, you know, we're rolling things out in Chicago. We need people in Chicago. And I think, oh, I worked with somebody who'd be perfect for this in Chicago. Let me get on LinkedIn, send her an email, let her know that we're looking up there. Whether she's someone who'd be interested in it, maybe she knows somebody who would be interested in that. Those are the types of things that come in handy. These networks tend to web out and work in other places as well to have those. And, and I think sometimes people don't, they don't take the time to do the networking or they think they don't have time to do the networking when in fact it's an incredibly important and valuable thing to do. These organizations are sort of the way that we can start creating those relationships. And in these geographical areas, if you're in the Atlanta area, if you're in South Florida, if you're in Central Florida, if you're in Washington, D.C. area, if you're in Chicago, if you're in Dallas, the people in those areas all start to get to know each other. And so the better you are at networking with those people, the easier it's going to be to go back and forth. It's, it's sort of the 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 nature of what we do that to move up i should say to move up but to increase your salary which for many of us is pretty important especially as we need more money uh you have to go from organization to organization so it's not unusual after three to four years to see people moving and some people will move every three to four years they will force themselves to move to another organization even though the job they have is going great but they know that if they want a double-digit increase in salary, they're going to have to move somewhere else. And they'll just do that every four years and move to the next place. I was fortunate enough in my last position as a systems engineer with Palo Alto Networks, I was there almost seven years. So, but, but that was a little bit different. We started as a startup company. I think I was the 95th employee. So we grew very rapidly. I think when I left, there was well over 700. Now, of course, there are over thousands of people working there. Um, but it's a company that was going very fast. So there, was, there was no reason to leave. There was way too much going on. Uh, but a lot of people will move after X number of years just because, and this may, this may be well beyond what many of you watching are having to worry about because you're just trying to get that first job. But there's a strategy to this as well. And it's about knowing people. It's more than just technology. It's about really what people are doing, knowing the different companies in your area, knowing what they're doing. Some companies uh, are doing better than others financially. Some have bigger projects going on than others. And there's great opportunities to move over, participate in those projects. Those are three to four year projects. Perfect time to then move to the next thing. Uh, sometimes that's what it takes. Just the the way that we uh, the way that we work with this technology becomes um, becomes requirement. You really can't do that with other types of uh, of vertical markets. If you're in a hospital, there's probably one or two hospitals, maybe more in your area, but that's it. You're kind of going between those three or four. With technology, you can go anywhere. 
And you can do anything. You can start with operating systems. You can move into networking. That might launch you into security. Maybe you're working in an organization in the internal part of the, an organization. Maybe you're working with a manufacturer. Maybe you're someone who likes to take it on the road. Maybe you like to travel internationally. There's jobs for that. Maybe you want to be a systems engineer in Australia. There's an opening. I guarantee it. And some organizations want to build out parts of the world. So you may end up in Singapore for three years before you come back to the U.S. You never know what this can do. And this is a type of, uh, of industry where you can do whatever you want. Build out the type of job you would like. There's a job for that out there. You just have to be able to do it and make that happen. Some of you are on the chat room, have uh, a few questions going back and forth. Um, there was one, let me flip back. Um, somebody talking about pocket ethernet. I don't know what pocket ethernet is. I have not run under pocket. It sounds like ethernet in your pocket. Pocket either smartphone connected cable tester. Oh, I've seen this before. I have seen this. Uh, one, it's what a good idea too. Something because normally to be able to do network analysis, you need some extra piece of hardware and a big laptop. But what if you could do it on a smartphone? That's what a lot of things are moving towards. I have not seen it operational. There's probably a video out there. I've just never gone through it. But I saw this uh, on some uh, site I was on where someone was using it. I carry around and have in my studio all of my cable testers. I have protocol analysis set up. I've got, uh, in fact, me. let me lean down here. Literally, uh, on the floor next to me, my serial cable, my USB to serial cable, a separate serial cable to technically, this is an RJ11 on the end of it. Uh, it's got all six wires. And uh, it's plugging into a USB connection that goes to a USB-C. It's a USB-B to a USB-C. So this is what I was using to troubleshoot the power problem I was having with my lights last week. Those of you that were listening in the pre-show and maybe you were watching the A-plus study group last week, we started a little bit late. I was a wee bit flustered because the lights wouldn't turn on. And when the lights aren't on in here, it's pretty dark. Uh, let me see if I can give you an idea of what, of what that might be like, because it's not good when you have this here. I'm going to uh, pull up, for example, uh, what I use um, so you can see it. So when I'm setting this up, I've got an APC um, a power distribution unit that's on the ceiling above me because all of my lights in here. You can't see them in this view, but they are strung down from the ceiling. And there's also some behind me. So normally when I start the study group, I log on. I have I have five of these PDUs that are running different parts of my desk and different and the lights. So I log on to the one with the lights. And I think there's only four lights there. And when the lights aren't on, I'll turn them all off immediately and ask me if I really want to do that. So when I started the study group, this is what it looked like. And I got to tell you, that's, uh, that's not a good study group. Now, <laughs> I've had, it's, and it really is this dark because when I do the study group, all of my blinds are closed or I have, I have curtains that go around all of the walls in this room uh, because it helps with the sound. So it's dark in here. If these screens weren't on, you wouldn't see me at all. So this is what it looked like prior to that. And I wasn't able to connect to this front end. So that was a bit of a problem. It wasn't responding at all. It wasn't pinging. I wasn't able to get there, period. So that was a little bit of a, of a challenge. So what I did was got a ladder out, climbed up, because the ceiling is, it's a high ceiling. So about 10 feet up there, I've got rack mounted onto the wall, wall mounted this, 1U PDU, and I was uh, I I unplugged it from the PDU and plugged it directly into the outlet. I have a four outlet that's on the wall way up there that's designed specifically for the studio. That's why it's way up there. So that got us past the study group. 
So I, I had to purchase a new PDU, replace it. I brought the old one down and plugged it in, and it's just dead. It has a warning light that turns on, and it doesn't do anything. I can't get it to the serial port. It doesn't boot. I'm assuming that it was hit with uh, a lightning surge that came through because I also lost um, my cable modem last week as well. And it was probably the same time frame that happened. I didn't lose anything else, just those two things. But that's the way it goes with power and being able to work through those. Um, so that's that's a little bit of a, of a challenge to have those there. Um, but now that's replaced. I had to get the serial connection because that's the only way to reset the password on the PDU. And that was a, a used PDU that, that I bought off of eBay uh, because it's a it's like a $600 PDU. But on eBay, you can find them for 99 bucks. So, of course, I'm going to buy it on eBay. And it was when in Florida, I got it literally the next day and got it installed. But that's why those cables are so important. Um, so you never know in your toolbox of things. I like the idea of the pocket Ethernet. If I didn't have to have all those cables, that would be really nice to have that. Yes, behind me, this is a real studio. Uh, it's not a green screen. You can't really see behind me in this view. But that is a real block fireplace that's behind me that's not uh, it's not made up it's not fake it's real i turned that fire on in the in the winter because i'm in north florida where it does get cold there is a cricket ball behind me uh and a electronic rubik's cube yes and there's you can kind of see the edge of the cricket bat sticking up back there past the uh the youtube silver display they sent me youtube's finally sent the uh the silver for a hundred thousand subscribers is a hundred thousand Something like that. I'll have to look. Uh, I think they sent it. The reason I don't know is they sent it to me. I think after I got past two hundred thousand. I think that's. I think that's what happened uh, for this. So what are you going to do uh, in that scenario um, to have all of those those options available? Yeah, we're up to. Is it ten thousand or is it twenty? Is it hundred? I don't remember uh, because we are at yeah, it's a hundred thousand subscribers. You get that plaque, which was really nice of them to send. Uh, but they sent it after I got to 200. So it's my 200,000 subscriber plaque that comes through. Um, so I, I do like the real background rather than a green screen. So yes, I do like to watch a little cricket, which is weird and difficult in the United States to watch cricket because it's not popular here. And so there's not a lot of options for watching live. You do have to pay for it if you want to do that. And it's going to be at weird hours because it's in other parts of the world. Uh, so I don't tend to watch very much live cricket. I do enjoy watching it when I have time. Uh, that's the challenge. I've got an old Mac cube up there. Uh, I've got some uh, a drawing of a um, of you can, it's kind of hard to see with the 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 light on it. I need to adjust my my lighting, but I've got a, a drawing of a um, a joystick, an old, old Atari joystick, and of course uh, my cigars are up there. So I just sort of move things around and add things as I go. So for those of you in the chat room wondering what in the world is back there. Yes, the dark the darkness is a little little weird to see. It's uh it's it's not quite as creepy when you're here. Normally my windows are open, but I like it dark in here when I'm working. So it's normally dark, although with the lights with the 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 curtains open, there's a lot more light that's coming in. So it's not as creepy as it looked in that particular picture, but still creepy enough to have that there. Uh, in the chat room, people are asking, uh, Taylor asked in the chat room, uh, if we go back and watch your old study groups, can you use the webinar credits even though the videos are old? Absolutely. Yeah, you can watch them at any time. You can go back to any of the study groups, and because I'm using that keyword somewhere in that first hour, you can watch any of the replays. Now, obviously, um, you can only use a certain number of webinar CEUs during a three-year period. So if you're trying to renew a Security Plus, you can only use 10 webinar CEUs in a three-year period. All of the other CEUs that you need to accumulate have to come from other categories. So it's a smaller number for Network Plus and an even smaller number for A+. You have to look on the CompTIA website to know exactly which ones it is um and and what they're what they're using what the criteria is for your particular certification that you're trying to renew and as i mentioned 
I think a lot of people are not going to use this accumulation of CEUs anymore because I think a lot of people like me wait until the last minute to do everything. And CompTIA has come up with a with a way to do this that you can last minute get this done. And I think it's actually less expensive than building out and accumulating and paying the CEU maintenance. Um, it is a CEU, it's it's CompTIA's Cert Master CE is what they call it. Uh, so I'm trying to find it on the CompTIA website. This is not as easy um, as, as I would like it to do. How to renew. Maybe that's what it is. We'll go into here. Learn about the continuing education program. You can renew with a single activity, complete CompTIA Cert Master CE. They've got Cert Master CE for A+, Network Plus, and Security Plus. For A+, plus to renew, 100 bucks takes four to six hours, boom, you're renewed for three years. No CEU accumulation. You don't have to pay for CEU maintenance. 100 bucks, you're done. Boom, in and out. Uh, right, because so the 900 series is the latest version. That's the only one there. You obviously wouldn't be renewing a 900 series right now. So that's why it says 800 series or older. When the new one comes out, you will see they will update the Cert Master CE. For the Cert Master CE Network Plus, $175, four to six hours. For the Security Plus, four to six hours, and again, $175. So that's, that's a very easy way to renew. That's a simple way to renew. So if you're someone who really does wait until the last minute, and you're trying to get this done. Someone came into my website and the chat was saying, I've got a week. Where do I get all these CEUs from? Help me, help me. How many can I accumulate? And I said, why don't you just do this? And they said, what, what are you talking about? Like four to six hours. I think the way they, they came back to the website uh, in the chat room and they were saying the way it works is there's some videos you watch and then there's a test and you have to get 100% on the test before you can continue. But if you don't get 100% on the test, you just take the test again. So you take the test over and over and over until you get 100%. Then you go to the next thing. So the, the goal here is that you renew the highest level exam, and that renews everything underneath it. So if you renew your Security Plus and you take the Security Plus Cert Master CE and you go through that, it will renew your Network Plus and your A Plus as well. Same thing for anything else. If you were renewing uh, Security Plus um, and you accumulated CEUs for Security Plus, it renews your Network Plus and your A Plus as well. So you only renew one thing, the highest level thing, and that covers everything underneath it. Yeah, I like this idea too. It's fast and it's easy. And it's, if you're on the last day and this is it, and you got to pass it on the, why would you take, in fact, they were playing to take an exam. They were studying for their, I think their SISA plus. They were trying to spend a week study for the SISA plus. So why would you do that? You're not going to pass the SISA plus studying a week. Just spend 175 bucks, renew it. Now you've got three years to take the SISA plus. So there you go. That's that's the real challenge. Yes, the CompTIA website, there's a lot to renew. The, the whole continuing education thing is very involved. You have to sit down and really read through it, start with the overview, understand what they're doing, learn about the CE program, understand the renewal path. There's a lot here. Uh, it's not so much confusing as it is big. There's just a lot there because you have all of these different certifications. They all have a different set of requirements. You have to understand what certifications are higher level and what certifications are lower level. Uh, that's the real, that's the real challenge. So you just, you just never know with these. I don't, uh, I don't, I, I think for me, probably Cert Master CE would be the way that I would renew, but different people do different things. So that's, that's, uh, that's up to you. And on all the details around the CompTIA website, there's lots of things you may not need to go back through all of my webinars and watch the old study groups and accumulate CEUs, you may just decide to do that instead. I think you should go back and watch all my videos. I'd love for you to go back and watch every single one of my old videos, but you may not have to. So it's up to you. Uh, maybe you'll find them so entertaining that you just can't help 
going back through the previous study groups, or maybe not. Let's not fool ourselves with this, shall we? Let's let's keep it completely honest. We are we are keeping it real here. We know that's not something we really want to do. I I think uh, you're better off take, doing the Cert Master CE. So there you go. How much time do you need to prepare for Network Plus 007? I don't think it's much different than the 006. I think it's a very similar exam. The content is very similar. The style of the exam is very similar. Most people study three to six months. If you've been in the industry for 10 years and you really know the content, it might take you a few weeks to make sure. But regardless, don't be, don't be thrown by... Um, by if you are if you're someone who has been in the industry, make sure you look at the exam objectives. Don't think that you can go right into the exam without knowing everything that's on there because networking is broad. There's going to be things on this exam you've not touched before, even in ten years. Um, and especially if you're if you're a CCNA, you know what Cisco has told you. There's stuff in the Network Plus that's not in the Cisco exams, so you're going to need to know those things. Um, but just go through the exam objectives. You may need no time. You may need a day. You may need enough time to go through the exam objectives and cross out all of the things you already know. And there might be two things on there that you just have never run into before or two things that are relatively new that are not part of Cisco's stuff. So maybe you circle those. I need to know those two things. You watch my video and you go take the exam. Maybe that's all you need. That's, uh, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, so that, that might be something to consider when you work through the details of that. Yeah, and if you already book, have a book, then you're better off. If you have my course notes, then that helps too. Go through the course notes, find the things you don't know. It kind of, maybe you don't have to watch the video then. Maybe just go off the notes. I don't recommend that. Uh, I recommend you use as many resources as possible. But if you're somebody like me that's been been installing firewalls forever and you understand the idea and you've got it you don't have to un you know what ethernet is and you know what an ipsec vpn is and you've put them together before you know maybe that's maybe that's all you need to be able to get through it if you're starting from scratch it obviously is going to take you a little bit longer if you've been in the industry like me then just go through all the exam objectives check them off and then you will know you're covered when you walk into the exam, CompTIA stays very, 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 very close to the exam objectives. So as long as you know those, you're going to do fine on the exam. You'll, you'll be able to figure it out. You'll be able to install that wireless network. See, you'll do, you'll do good. But in fact, I got to wonder if you've already been through the Cisco cybersecurity and all of these other things. Is somebody asking for Network Plus? Is somebody asking for the 007? That seems to be an unusual shift. Normally, you keep going the other direction. But some people, if you work for a value-added reseller or a contractor, there are certain things they, they insist that you have. So you may find yourself going back and passing that so they can say on their list, we have this many people that have Network Plus, these many people have Security Plus. And if it's something you're already familiar with, then it's a, an easy one. So that's that is it's not up to you at that point. It's up to the contractor and what they expect. So that that sometimes happens. That's just the weird world we live in. You'll find that if you stop fighting that so much and start working with it and figuring it out, it works a lot better. I I used to fight that like no, that doesn't make sense. Why do I have to take Network Plus? I already know the Cisco. Stop it. Well, it's a lot easier just take it and then you're done. Is it really that hard? That wasn't. So that's that's one of those where um, early in my career, somebody told me I was getting frustrated about some weird thing that a corporation does. You know, pick any one of the weird things that corporations do, and they said, "I don't, I don't know what you're doing because there's always going to be politics. There's always going to be corporate weirdness. You're not going to be able to get out of it." It's always there. As much as you don't want it to be there and as much as you wouldn't do it that way if you were running things, it's here. It's a reality. It exists. So the sooner you figure out how to work with it rather than working against it, the much better things are going to be for you overall in your mind, in the way that you work with others. In every, you'll just be happier. And he was right. You just get happier. Like, oh, what do you want? 
You want me to take Network Plus? No problem. When do you want that done by? Got it. No problem. Well, you know, in three years, I'm going to another company, right? Okay. Got it. So it's one of those weird things about careers and how you move from place to place that uh, no problem. Uh, the chat room, what's the maximum number? You know, I wouldn't say be a yes man, but you have to work with these things. You, there's gonna, It's a give and take. You were so eager to go take your network plus that now when it comes time at the end of the year for your evaluations, you're going to get a better evaluation. You're going to get more money. Oh, okay. Well, that was easy. I wouldn't say call. I wouldn't say it's a yes, man. I would say I'm leveraging myself for a higher paycheck. Uh, how many, uh, that one time I watched a dude's car. Do you need me to take the garbage out? I can sweep up whatever you need. My goal is to make my boss happy. Because if my boss is happy, everything else works. It's not a bad strategy. What's the maximum number of performance-based questions they put on the test? Is it known? We don't. Generally, it's a handful. You might get fewer. You might get more. But generally, it's three to five, I would think. From most, most reports of what people are saying, which they shouldn't be saying because they signed a document that says they're not going to say what's on the exam, but word gets around, guys talk, and you hear things. But what I'm hearing on the street is a handful, plus or minus. So that's that's the that's the world street. So it's not a massive number. You're not sitting through 10 performance-based questions unless maybe you did something very bad in a past life. Then maybe you'll get 10 of them. But generally it's a handful. You never know because the exams are all random. It's a different pool. You never know what you're going to get. Every exam is different. The exam you take now, if you take the exam two times, it's going to be a different exam. So you just don't know. But I, uh, I intentionally don't sign a candidate agreement so I can talk about it. They're not going to take my certification away because I didn't sign an agreement because I didn't take the exam. I don't need to take the exams anymore because I don't need to use the exam. I write the content for the, anyway. That's one of the benefits of working around some of those challenges is that I can say it, just other people technically, legally can't say it. But I think that that puts you at an advantage that I'm able to tell you. So there, that's how I justify it myself. Whether it's ethical or not, I guess there's a different set of requirements for that. But I don't think I'm giving away anything by telling you there's a handful of questions. I think we're pretty good with that. I'm not going to tell you what's on the exam. I'm not going to give you examples of questions. I don't recommend you do anything like that. I would hope that you would not. I think uh, the test is better if you pass it really knowing the content. It helps you from a career perspective, and it helps you be a better person. I think that's a good way to look at it anyway. Okay. Well, that's uh, that brings us to, gosh, is it the uh, another hour has gone by? It has. That's, uh, that's plenty of content for a single day. Can you believe it? Thanks for sticking around for the Q&A. Thanks for being here in the chat room. Uh, be looking out uh, next week for the Security Plus Study Group. It's on the same time, same day, on a Wednesday, next Wednesday. So in twenty, uh, in six days and, and 22 hours, I guess, we'll be doing this again. We hope to see you back here for that, even if you'd like to call in or follow through with the questions. It might help you with some of your Network Plus stuff as well. Uh, it's certainly uh, something worthwhile if you're ever planning to get into the Security Plus as well. We've got uh, also... On the website is the calendar, which will show you the links for the study groups for next month. Remember, we're skipping over the first week of the month for the July 4th Independence Day that we celebrate here in the United States. But we pick up with the A-plus Network Plus and Security Plus in July as well. You can always at any time, though, send me a note from the top or the bottom of my website from the Contact Us link. I try to get back to everyone if, uh, if you need an answer for something. You don't have to wait for study group. We're always here. And the chat room is always available on the website 24 by 7. Thanks for stopping by this time. Thanks for hanging out for the Q&A. Thanks for being here in the after show. And just thanks for being here. You're pre we, we really do appreciate your participation. We appreciate you being here throughout the entire month. And we can't wait to see you next time on the Network Plus study group. Thanks, everyone.